My name is Helen Hosendi. Um, I work at this really cool place called Ten Up. You can also find us upstairs. There's like a Google booth. Um, and so some of us have been up there through the day, and today and yesterday. Um, I'm also, I guess, still a lead developer for the WordPress core software project, uh, which we're all here about, I assume. And uh, I also led the 4.0 and 4.7 releases specifically. Um, all right. So what I want to talk to you today about is the editing experiences that we build for other people, whether that's our clients, um, ourselves, uh, theme and plugin users, right? A lot of theme and plugin developers out here probably, um, or really anybody who uses the core WordPress software. Um, this is not a code talk. Um, I, have, I have a really hard time giving those, and I think they're better suited uh, for most people for workshops. Um, what this is, is it's, it's meant to be inspirational and to get you thinking um, about where we, where we are and where we should go, especially with 5.0 being released two, two days ago. Um, so broadly, what I hope that you get out of this is not, not actually that metaboxes themselves are bad and should never be used, nothing you know, sweeping like that, um, but that we as creators of these experiences for ourselves and for other people, we need to be more thoughtful about when we're doing things that are familiar and when we're prioritizing you know, our needs as developers and our desire for control uh, versus really aiming for the best possible experience for our users. OK, so why did I call this Metaboxes Considered Harmful then? Um, this is definitely like an incendiary talk title. It's to get your attention, you know, click data of talk titles. Uh, it's, it's a riff on a really, really common trope in, in our industry, in the tech industry, um, where a given piece of technology becomes super popular, right? And it becomes popular enough for other people out there who maybe are using it, maybe are not, you know, uh, but they dedicate their time to breaking down the shortcomings of that piece of tech uh, in a blog post, uh, or sometimes a talk, or sometimes like a full on paper. Um, this considered harmful structure, it actually originated in 1968. Uh, with a letter called Go-To Statement Considered Harmful. Uh, <laughs> it's actually something that's extremely funny to think about today in WordPress, because hooks are basically just go-tos. <laughs> All right, so what do I mean when I talk about a meta box? What, what is this meta box that I'm talking about? At a base level and on a code level, actually, in WordPress, um, it's these panels that we find all over the WordPress admin. Uh, they're a layout component. They can hold anything. Uh, right here, this is your dashboard, sort of by default. I think I hid something. Um, but you get like your at a glance, activity, WordPress events. Um, you can see that my events here are for Costa Rica, because that's actually where I live. Um, so these, these, are, these are the things that you see in meta boxes on your dashboard. Um, they typically respond to your preferences, right? You can move them around, and you know that's retained in your user preferences. You can collapse them, you can hide them, um, all sorts of things. Um, so that's what a meta box is at a base level. But I think, you know, in, in common usage and definitely in the context of this talk, um, what I'm talking about are meta boxes as those panels that we use on the editor screen. Uh, there are a lot of them that are built into WordPress. Uh, so here you can see like publish, categories and tags, our favorite custom fields meta box. Uh, and then, you know, for especially for those of us who do development or anybody who works on content on, you know, sort of what we call like enterprise or publisher sites, um, it's very, very common to see custom meta boxes. Um, and there are a lot of really popular plugins out there as well that insert custom meta boxes. So here's an example of a very, very typical, uh, very bare bones, but very typical custom meta box. Um, so this is this is a real site. Uh, it's a real example. Uh, this is this is my husband's website. He's literally on stage at the Guggenheim right now, warming up for Peter and the Wolf. That's what that's what this is. This is an actual listing uh, from his website. So this is you can see in this meta box, right? We have like start date, end date, time, you know, the venue, URL address, right, content, title, right? You know, our, our usual kind of stuff. So, so actually, before before we continue on with that example, I want to take a step back in time. Okay, we're going to go back to 2012. Uh, the WordPress customizer is actually just exiting prototyping. 
Uh, custom Metabox frameworks are, I think, about to enter sort of a renaissance period, right? We're talking like CMB2, I think, is what we all called it, um, advanced custom fields. I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with that. Um, so we're about to enter into a period of high development and high usage for those kinds of plugins um, and frameworks. Um, Brad and Angelina are about to get married, and Obama's about to get reelected. Uh, the Nets have moved to Brooklyn, and the Knicks have Linsanity. I'm really into basketball. Um, <laughs> Michaela Maroney is not impressed. Uh, Sandy happens, <laughs> Superstorm Sandy happens, and a bunch of us are stranded on Tybee Island after the first WordPress Contributor Summit. Um, a lot of, a lot of uh, terrible things also happened that year. Uh, Trying try to keep this light, not gonna get too dark. Um, but basically, 2012 was a while ago, right? It's, it's six years ago, right? And we, we feel like, okay, now in 2018, maybe 2012 wasn't that long ago, but think about how you felt in 2004, right? Like 1998 felt like an eternity ago, totally different era. Um, I mean, like, even this year, right? Like, the, the 2018 Olympics, do you, do you even remember that that happened, right? That feels like that happened so long ago, so I, I have no idea how we even measure time at this point. <laughs> All right, so in 2012, this is what I was working on. This is an example of a site that I was working on. These are actually screenshots from a talk that I gave in, like, 2013. Um, like, I, I, I can't even find the actual site anymore <laughs> to get current screenshots out of. Um, but this is, this is what I was working on. It was a fashion industry client site, um, a blog, and they had this highly artwork-driven homepage grid um, that I needed to build out, right? So it was really cool building out, like, the HTML and the CSS and having, like, this little crowns be, you know, like, you know, before, you know, pseudo elements, right? Like, getting into all the, all the, the you know, nitty-gritty of the code of building it out. Um, and then when I got into having to create the editing experience, I had to really think about, you know, how do I, how do I make an editing experience for this, right? Um, and for those of you who know me, um, I have a very certain aesthetic <laughs> about things. Um, and and I, I couldn't just let it go by and be sort of like the, the usual that we might think about doing. Okay, so, so the usual, I think, would be something like this. Very basic meta box on like the home page edit screen, right? Like you have a static front page and you have a meta box that's just on that, that edit screen. And you put a bunch of stuff in drop downs, right? We, we can split it into like left layout, right layout, right? And we can say like it's a three up, it's a four up, whatever, right? We can, we can pick those from a drop down, you know, and pick your up to eight posts that show up in that grid, right? Very, very controlled very easy to understand what it is, right, from, from like a actually picking stuff out kind of viewpoint. It's, it's fairly easy to understand what's going on, right? This is very easy to build out. This is actually a screenshot that I made like an hour ago <laughs> using advanced custom fields, okay? So, um, so that's, that's what we would think of as like a basic example um, of what a meta box for that might be. For me, however, this was not good enough for a lot of reasons. This is what I ended up building. Um, this was a JavaScript-driven thing, not in Backbone. Not, I'm pretty sure it was just like really terrible jQuery that I don't ever want to see again. Um, but it was a separate options page. Um, so you have to remember, this was before the customizer, right? The customizer came out later that year. Um, so I didn't have that paradigm to refer to. Like I didn't even, I couldn't even think of that as a thing that existed. So for me, I still thought of, right, like a, a default WordPress experience. And so for me, that was a separate options page. Um, because this was a very wide layout, and I didn't want to stick it inside a meta box. Um, so we have visual representations of the you know one up to four up at the top for each of the sides, uh, and then you get you know as you as you change those, it changes live um, and moves the posts around just based on order. You know like one two three four, um, and then you get a visual representation representation of each of the posts that you've selected to go into that grid. So you get a full size full preview of what you're gonna get on the front, right? And to me, it felt like for a fashion brand especially, this was very, very important to have for them. So this, this is what picking a post was like, right? We have like an empty slot here. And we're like, okay, I need, I need to stick a post there. Click select post, you get a little, you know, crappy modal <laughs> that comes up. Um, but with, with the featured images, remember this is, this is very visually driven and we need the information, right, for them. They need, this, they need to understand like what is maybe the featured image, we'll get into that, that's gonna show up in this grid. So you pick one, sticks it in place, okay? Um, and then everything is there for editors to check out. They can check out that featured image, 
right? That's so important to this layout. They can check out the flow of the text, right? This is something that um, we really need to think about as we get into like dicing up mockups, right? Like a lot of mockups are for ideal situations and they don't account for people with long names or a really long post excerpt, right? They don't, they don't think about these things. So we have this preview mechanism where the editors can check the text flow, right? Where how long are these things? Do they fit inside these height limited boxes? They are height limited. So they can check their excerpts and decide, is this a good fit for this area? Maybe not. Maybe they can make some different decisions editorially um, and visually based on this preview that we're giving them. And this is a significantly better experience for them in all ways than sticking something inside of a meta box, right? So now, I know this is called meta boxes considered harmful, but I did actually involve a meta box in, in, a, in service of this site, in service of this grid. The meta box that I built was for something else. It was for multiple featured images, okay? Or more descriptively in this case, we called them post thumbnails because there isn't like a single featured image or a bunch of different thumbnails that they could pull from. Um, so because of the way that homepage layout was done, right, you had some really wide landscape images, you had some portrait, uh, oriented images and their archives had square thumbnails and then they had like really wide landscape featured images like for individual posts. Um, editors really needed a high level of control over that imagery for all those different situations, right? Um, so, and, and remember, this is a fashion brand, right? So if you have a portrait shot of a model and you auto crop it to be wide landscape, <laughs> not a good idea, right? Um, so, that's, so that's what we have here um, for them. So we, we do still involve meta boxes, but we have to be really mindful about you know, which type of information we're choosing to manage in which way and when. So that's the meat of this, right? Meta boxes are okay, right? But they can still be harmful. And the reason why I think that they've become harmful is because we've allowed ourselves to kind of settle back into them a little bit too far, right? Back in 2012, before we had those meta box frameworks that would have made it really, really easy for me to spin up you know, a bunch of fields, right? And before we had the customizer to think about, we really had to get creative about what we were building. Some of that didn't end up so great, right? We have, um, I think Gary might have mentioned this in his talk yesterday, uh, where we have like very fractured UIs across different plugins, across different themes, right? So not all of the outcomes have been great, but we were being really creative about what we were doing. We were pushing boundaries, we were you know, ripping our hair out, writing custom things, right? And trying to come up with different patterns that we could use within WordPress because unfortunately, still WordPress does not provide you with a lot of patterns and reusable pieces um, and components to use. Um, so we were doing that back in 2012. But I think since then, with sort of like the renaissance of meta boxes and the explosion of like sort of the WordPress development economy, right, we, we all have a lot to do, right? We're all very busy all the time. We're super busy at Tenna all the time, even though I don't even work on client stuff anymore. It's just, you know, I know what, what everybody's dealing with. So, you know, we, we, we started to take kind of shortcuts and we started to think about ourselves as developers first rather than thinking about that experience and getting creative with what we're, with what we're doing. And so we've kind of settled down into using meta boxes for everything. So what's happened in the meantime in WordPress core, right, and, and where a lot of friction has been in those years in between, between the developer community, you know, custom development community and the WordPress core development community, has been that the WordPress admin itself has actually fully embraced visually driven editing, right? Editing and management experiences. The customizer, even the new media library, new, it's not really that new, I guess. Um, <laughs> we keep calling it that, and it's not new at all. Um, uh, now with, with Gutenberg and the, the new block-based editor in 5.0, right? We've really embraced that in WordPress core, and where, you know, in the meantime, the custom development community has kind of you know, stayed, stayed a little static, I think, and uh, been, been reluctant to embrace stuff like the customizers. There are definitely people out there who have done really, really cool things um, for their clients, and you know, you, if you go to like talks at like uh, the dot-com VIP meetups and that sort of thing, people give really cool talks about really cool things that they're doing with these custom, you know, visually driven UIs, but I actually think that they're, they're relatively uncommon, right? That's, this is not the, the lowest common denominator for custom development in WordPress. Um, the things that we see in really big agencies are not what people are doing day to day. Okay, so I wanna go back to my husband who is currently pretending to be a cat by way of playing clarinet <laughs> in Peter and the Wolf today. Um, yeah, he's gonna watch this later and be like, why are you talking about me? Uh, <laughs> 
Okay, so so this this editor has been working fine for years. Okay, I built this before I was even at Ten Up. This is like code from 2010, 2011 when I still worked at a music school um, as a web developer. But I worked at a music school that I had gone to, um, and I look at my code now, and it's you know, like ah, oh, it's so terrible. But it's fine, right? It's fine. It's working. He's happy. I'm happy. Everything's good, right? He can enter stuff, and it shows up on his website, and that's what he really cares about. Um, this is this is what it looks like, like an individual. Um, event, right? You get like title, a human formatted date after picking some specific, you know, picking one in the back end, you know, and you get a map um, with it. And this is what it looks like on the archive, which is the events calendar, right? You have like upcoming events and past events. And so that start date, that end date, that becomes critical in how we present this. Um, I I had no interest in messing with post statuses at the time, and I still don't. So it doesn't it doesn't use the publish date because everything that you're creating is in the future, right? So like we don't we don't want to go messing with that. So it's a piece of metadata. It is appropriately a piece of metadata that we have set in a meta box. Um, so so we look at this, and it's like okay, everything's fine. It's working. So so what am I doing with this site? Why am I messing with it? Right? 5.0 is out. His site's already updated because my husband is a very, very typical user, and I just have everything set to auto-update because he is never going to do it otherwise. Okay, so his site's already on 5.0. What's going to happen? It's nothing. Actually, it's going to happen. He's going to go to edit his event, and it's going to look exactly the same right now um, until I upload my changes. Once I set show and rest to true for the event's post type, it's like the only code in this talk. Um, this is this is what it looks like in Gutenberg. It just works, okay. This is this is not you know some huge scary change. You know, definitely I've been dealing with shoring up plugins and fixing up things for Gutenberg for like the last couple of weeks, months, um, and you know I understand. But I think for a lot of a lot of these things, like things are fine, they're working, right? All I did was add one line to the code, two lines. I think I had to do something about the meta box back compat mode. And it just shows up. And you know what? It still works. I tried it. jQuery date picker still works inside of Gutenberg. Doesn't it sound nuts. It works. <laughs> it's fine. Everything's great. You know. And, uh, kudos to the team for, for making that happen. You know. Um, so yeah, this thing just works. It's fine. I don't have to go messing with it anymore. Um, I don't have to teach my husband how to do anything new. Um, the only thing that I want to do further maybe is like turn off comment support because for some reason I have it on for an events post type. I wasn't thinking, I guess, and this discussion panel can't be turned off anymore, right? Like we, it used to be a meta box so you could like go into your screen options and turn it off. Now I can't do that anymore. So I'm going to turn off comment support. But let's take a step back, right? This is what I want. This is what I want all of us to do. I want us all to take a step back from these things that we have, and that work, it's like they're fine, right? We don't have to change anything. But I want us to take a step back, right? So let's go back to this front end view for his website, right? Um, first of all, we still have that friction of save and preview for your changes, right? Which also comes with its own bag of technical problems around how meta is saved against revisions. <laughs> Sorry, Adam. Uh, <laughs> all, all kinds of fun things around how you store that data, how you preview that data, right? So it comes with a bag of technical difficulties. Um, and then you still have like that friction of like they have to go preview it in order to see what happens with that data that they've entered. Um, so I want to think about like what, what can I do better um, to give him that kind of that that better kind of outcome, right? What's the best possible UI that I can give him, while still controlling the experience a bit, giving him guidelines, giving him guideposts, um, and and ensuring helping ensure that sort of ideal outcome. So, this is what I think about when I'm looking at this again with fresh eyes. I actually wrote these out as I was writing the code. So these are like really truly my live thoughts. So here's what I see. There's no way of verifying that this map is correct or is even going to like put the pin in the right place in the meantime, right? Like especially in New York, like we, we have the zip code here so that helps, but like there are multiple streets named the same thing depending on the borough, depending on like, you know, you could mistype Ave and Street, you know, like if you're in Queens, it's super fun. <laughs> that happens to a lot of people. 
Uh, so there's no way of like verifying that this map is correct in the meantime, right? Um, there might be more relevant links than just the venue. And, and here he's like sort of stopped thinking about what kinds of links you might want to include, like maybe to tickets, maybe to like more information about individual artists, right? There, there are other links that you might want to include that of course you could stick in the content area, but because you've split out venue for whatever reason, and it's not used in any sort of like grouping manner, it's not a taxonomy, you know, just kind of stops thinking about it. Um, and most importantly, the date and time, the start date, end date, um, they're actually too restrictive. This show, um, we, we do need them. We need them because it controls that chronology, right, on, on the archive. But this particular show, there are 10 of them over the space of two weekends. I actually thought I was never going to be able to come to WordCamp US again because he does this every December. Um, and we have, we have small children, so like, you know, you go do the gig and I'll stay out of WordCamp. But I'm here. Um, so so this, is, this is an event that happens 10 times over the course of two weekends, right? Um, it's nonsense to make individual events for each one. The way that his site is laid out, the way that people navigate his site, the way that we intend for people to navigate his site has nothing to do with individual events, right? It's just you have a blob and you should be able to say these days shows at 1, 2, 30, 4, 30, right? Instead of like just one start date and one end date. So now that we've thought about this in the context of his site, what kind of information actually should be on his site, what if we started thinking about blocks instead? Here's the next step that we can take. This is actual code, actual screenshot. So here I have removed some of those fields that I talked about, the map field, the venue field, and URL. And what I've added is a block template for the event post type. Um, so when you hit add new, this is what you see right away. Okay, you can remove these blocks, whatever, but they're kind of there. They have placeholders to let you know this is what we think would look really good in these areas. Um, I didn't write a custom map block. and I haven't gotten an API key because it seemed very annoying, so I didn't bother doing it. Um, I'm, a, I'm a normal user, too. Um, so, uh, but I didn't write a custom map block. I installed a plugin to give me a map block, and I think Jetpack comes with one now. So it's, it's like it's a super cool world that we live in where like I don't have to write these things myself anymore. I can see what else is out there, pull that in, reference it. There's some funny things about you know, specifying blocks in a template if they don't um, exist anymore, and so I need to file a bug report about that. Um, but yeah, so what you get here is you get some, some paragraph blocks with placeholders in them to let you know what kind of information we think would look good there. You get your map box, and you still get your start time and end date. As I said, this is, this is a real example, but it's, I'm not done yet, right? I still need editor styles. I need that blue background. I need the font, the font color, right? I need all of that stuff in there to mimic the front end of the site even better, right? So we're truly getting that visual preview, not full front end editing, but a true visual preview of what you're going to get. Um, another thing that I might want to do is some trickery around that start date, end date, um, and populate that first paragraph if it's empty, and all he does is enter stuff in the meta box instead, so he doesn't have to manually recreate that information if he doesn't need to for that particular event, right? So I might want to do some trickery around that. So for something that is relatively simple, and again, that was working just fine, I did not have to touch it, um, there are actually a lot of possibilities if we take a step back and we really think about what's here, what should we be doing, what helps the user, right? Um, I want, I'm, I, I'm really excited about this actually, I'm actually excited again about this events thing that I wrote in 2011. Um, I have a lot to learn about dealing with blocks and templates. I have, I don't even know where to start with taking stuff out of that meta box and putting it into a paragraph block. I have no idea what's going on. I have to figure that out, right? I'm a, I'm a developer and I have to learn it. But I am really excited about this, this richer, more flexible editing experience. Um, and, ha and how, how good it feels and how, you know, how, what it becomes while it's still like guiding my very handsome editor in the right direction. All right, so thinking, about, thinking outside the box. Um, metadata about a post, as I said, it's still really important, right? There's still spaces where having meta boxes that contain form fields for metadata are still important. They're still gonna be necessary for certain things, right? What, what's important here is to take that step back, like I've been saying, um, and think about what is truly that metadata about a post, right? We've spent you know, a lot of time thinking about 
what is the difference between post-meta and taxonomies, right? Like we've we've talked a bit about that. I think sometimes even still those get those get a little bit mixed up and conflated, and it is hard to separate them. Like what's grouping, what is descriptive, right? Um, but you want you want to think about what is truly that kind of metadata, what is descriptive about the post, and what is actually content that is a component of that post, right? And we don't want to be control first, right? We want to actually be able to separate that. What is a content editing experience from what is a de sorry a descriptive, you know, metadata editing experience? Um, so I want to I want to take a quick look at some interesting blocks. Um, for, for Gutenberg. Um, these are examples of things that maybe aren't actually quite metadata, but they do deserve visual previews, and, and they're really cool um, as blocks. So here's a super cool one from Nick Hamsey, I hope I'm saying his name right, uh, called Guidepost. Um, it's a table of contents block that updates live as you add headings to your post. Um, you know, semantic, well-structured HTML, accessibility, right, all those things, those matter a lot, right? And so th this, is a, this is a super cool block. Like, think about it for when you have, like, long documents, right? Readmes, guides, recipes, like, all kinds of things can really benefit from having a proper header structure, right, and sort of a table, table of contents. Uh, that auto-generates itself, so you don't have to do it yourself. And the fact that it live updates, that it's a block that you just insert and let it go, um, is, is super, super cool, right? No more short codes, no more wondering how that's going to look on the front end. You get this actual live updating preview of what's going to happen. This is something I wrote a blog post about a while back, right? promoing my own stuff. Um, thinking about advertising as a first class component of your content. The publishing industry right, has become sort of hyper aware of what ads mean to them, mean to their content, mean to the industry. right? Um, and I truly believe that it's critical that we treat them as a part of how articles are shaped, how they're written, how we put them together, and what kind of content is served inside that ad space. right? You don't want an ad interrupting you just as you get to like the really good part of an article, right? You don't, you don't want that. You want, you want the cliffhanger to be in the right spot, right? Um, you don't want a gun ad in the middle of an article about gun violence, right? We, we want to be mindful about what we're serving up, how we're serving up, how we're shaping that story for somebody. Um, so this particular mock-up is showing pre-inserted ads. This is like the block template thing again, right? Where you open up an ad new and you've got these things already in place and you put your stuff around them. Um, this, is a, this is a pretty common paradigm where you have like a certain number of ad slots that have to be shown on a page um, and you kind of want to shape your content to go around them. Um, and that's, that's what it allows the editor to do, right? It allows the editor to think like maybe I want one introductory paragraph and then the ad is like a pause of sorts, right? Because it's like television, right? It, it is a narrative. Um, you get a pause, you get a you know longer bit, you get to like a really exciting part, pause, right? And then you continue. Um, and that's something that you can think about by treating ads this way. Um, I think as the block API continues to evolve, and you can see like how outdated these mockups are already, right? Like the UI is already different in Gutenberg. Um, we might even be able to do something like auto-inserting ads every few blocks of a certain type. Right? We don't want to insert a new ad every few you know, short little blocks, but every few paragraphs, every few images, something like that. Right? So we might be able to auto-insert a block every once in a while based on what's come before it. Um, and then maybe you could even move them around within certain limits. Right? Like you could move it up or down one. Um, maybe our days of like parsing HTML in order to insert programmatic ads, maybe those could come to an end. Right? It's very unpleasant experience for developers. Um, this is a this is a really cool demo I saw the other day. I'm like very upset that I didn't think to do this. Um, this is using a block. Let me see. Is it going to play? There we go. Um, it's using a block to control background imagery with shapes and patterns. I'm, I'm going to let this play out. It's like a minute. Um, I don't know if I should narrate it. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> I don't know, it's like self-explanatory, but um, for people, I guess, who can't see it. So there's, there's shape control, so you can pick shapes, um, sizes, where it's located, um, and then add another shape. And so these are blocks that don't actually take up space, right? These are actually background blocks that go behind your stuff. But because they want to be able to layer shapes and patterns on top of each other, 
right? There are two ways that you could accomplish this, right? You insert one block and then you have like repeaters or you insert multiple blocks with different shapes. In this case, they've chosen multiple blocks, um, which is pretty cool. Um, and so you can do a shape. They've got a sh very lightly colored shape back there um, and then patterns. Um, and I just thought that that was a really, really cool way of thinking about something that it is descriptive about a post, right? It is metadata and probably storing it as post meta or whatever, but you get that visual interactive way of dealing with it and you get to see how it actually meshes with your content, right? Like maybe a triangle would look really stupid in this context, I don't know, you know? Um, so, so you really get that, that level of control and um, you can control colors, et cetera, to match your template um, and all of that. And I just thought that that was a, a really cool way of thinking about blocks as something beyond the content, but still as an integral part of it. The final thing that I want to think about is thinking about outside of that single post preview concept, right? So this is this is a problem across CMSs. A lot of people have been talking about it recently. Um, I, I saw somebody at Lullabot, a Drupal person, talking about it just like a couple of days ago, um, which is, what do we do about previewing stuff in different contexts, right? This is what comes next. This is this is what that that first example that I showed you from like back in 2012 was about. Was about previewing stuff outside of that single post in archives, right? What is your stuff going to look like in an archive? What is it going to look like, you know, on a home page with a featured image versus the featured image on the individual post, right? That's that's the thing that we really need to think about going forward. Um, and I think that this is what I'm excited about when I think about what has been declared as phase two of Gutenberg, right? We're, we're getting into blocks now, right? They've been introduced in the editor, right? We have time to get used to it, hopefully, um, as, as like a concept of our sites, as, as the base of our sites. And what's coming next, and hopefully you're, you've all heard of it, but if not, I would highly recommend looking up what's been declared as phase two for block-based editing, which is that it should encompass the rest of your site. Right? You're going to insert blocks and control lots of things. So we already have this, widgets, menus. These are blocks. right? So we're going to take all of these disparate concepts that we have, going to unify them as blocks. And that's something that's really powerful to think about because we now can get ahead of the curve and start thinking about things like, what if we want to preview something outside of that single post preview context? Right? When we get into reusable blocks, dynamic blocks, that sort of thing, we can get into what, does it, what is it like when you want to preview something outside of just the individual post context? I promised I was going to do this. I put a Cardi B quote. Um, <laughs> it, is, it is really good and healthy for our community to disagree. There's been a lot of disagreement lately. You know? um, but what, what I want to think about is, is focusing on getting creative again, right? Like focusing on something... Um, positive, constructive, right? Get out of litigating the process, right? It's done. I have opinions too. Whatever, it's fine. Um, I, I, I want to get, I want to move forward, and I want to really think about like what are the possibilities that this brings to us, whatever the timing might be. Um, you know, got to change it up, change up what you're doing. Um, I translated this for you, for those of you who are not super into Cardi B. This is me saying embrace the change, right? Um, <laughs> uh, you know, just stop, stop, you know, fighting with the software. Stop fighting with the software. Think about, like, what is it going to enable you to do? What is exciting about this thing that is happening? Uh, what is scary, right? It's, again, totally natural, normal to feel scared by it. It is intimidating. The JavaScript stuff, like, I don't know what's going on sometimes, you know? That's fine. We, you know, we have to figure it out. We have to learn. We have to grow as developers. And hopefully, we can create even better experiences. I don't want us to get stuck in continuing to want to do things the way that they always have been. I don't want us to think like, OK, my meta box works. It's fine. I'm just going to leave it alone forever. Right? That's not good enough. I want us to be a better community. I want us to do better things with WordPress. Right? And that's a part of how we can grow as a software project. Right? Agencies, custom development, this is all a part of how the ecosystem continues to grow. And if we don't break out of that and get more creative, build better experiences, we're not going to be able to do that, no matter how much more the core software does. All right, that's it for my talk. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you, Helen. Thank you. Is there? Do I have any questions for Helen? Really? No questions for me? Everybody's afraid of There we go. <laughs> All right.
Hey, Helen, great talk. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, so I have a question, if, if you could think off the top of your head of a like UI example outside of the WordPress space in other apps or mobile apps or things in your everyday life that you're like, oh, I wish I could see that in WordPress. Ooh. Um, one thing that I've been using a lot recently for um, organizing my brain, basically, I still love my paper planner. I don't, I don't know how many of you are paper planner users. I'm one of those. Um, but another thing that I've been using for sort of um, trying to organize my brain a little bit more, especially as I've like moved countries and like had children and all this stuff, you know, there's just a lot going on. Um, so what I've been using is an app called Notion, which is super cool. Um, I don't, I don't think that like WordPress should recreate Notion, right? I don't, I don't think anything like that. But sort of the the way that this like single app environment works, the way that you have like a very clean preview of what's happening, it is a block based editor, extremely explicitly block based editor, um, and it, and it made me think of Gutenberg as I as I started using Notion probably about a, about a year ago. Um, and that's something that's been really cool to me. So it doesn't have sort of like the web preview context, right? It doesn't have that end of things. But as an app, it's just like super interesting to think about what are blocks, how do they interact, you know? Like how, how do I use this thing? How does my brain work? How does a tool match my brain, right? Like that's, that's I think, one of the things about custom development for WordPress is we're trying to match the way people think and not everybody thinks the same way, right? So it's, it's like teaching. Right? You, you, sometimes you have to change up your teaching methods to match what actually works for a given student. You might have to try like 17 different things for a class of 12 people, you know? But that's how it is too with custom development, right? We really have to think about like how, how is this particular set of users gonna need things to be shaped for them um, in order to work for them? And I think that's what's really cool about custom development as opposed to something like Notion where I'm like trying to bend the tool to fit my brain all the time. Someone else down here? I don't know. <laughs> Hi, Helen. Hi. Um, I'm wondering what do you see as the business or monetary benefits of better experiences that you get by not providing, you know, just a bunch of meta boxes are? Yeah. So I, I do think about this quite a bit, you know, being in the being in the agency space, and um, I've actually I've been at Tenet for seven and a half years. Yeah, Jake's, Jake's nodding his head. Um, I was a first, first full-time employee there, so it's been a very, very long time and very involved in a lot of you know, business and sort of things and thinking about like how do we grow as a business like in my role, right? Like how does open source development, something that we're not you know, directly getting paid for necessarily most of the time, how does that still translate to like business objectives and how does it help grow our business, right? So for something like this, there are, there are a lot of different things you can get out of it. I mean, there's the ideological, right? Like we just should be doing this makes our clients happier, they're happier to stick around, they stay on their retainers, they do new projects with us, they refer other clients to us, right? Like the, your, your client relationship, I think, is really number one, in, especially in the agency space, right? Like the way that they continue their business and can bring in new business. Um, I think that it helps your developers just be better, better developers, continue to grow, right? Again, it's very easy to kind of get stuck in the same thing and never really grow as developers. And I hope that for a lot of us, you know, that is still an exciting part of the web, right? Working in the web industry is that we do get to do new and exciting things all of the time, right? Sometimes it's hard, sometimes we don't know what's going on, but it, that should still hopefully be an exciting part of what you're doing and hopefully something that still appeals to a lot of us. It's not to say it's the only reason why people get into it, right? Like I got into web development so I'd have like health insurance, you know, <laughs> like very, very practical consideration. Um, but but it, then it turns out that this is a really exciting part of the process for me, right? It's that stuff like this where the, the software is constantly evolving and I really get to sharpen my skills and not just the development skills but also my UX skills my thinking skills, my business skills, my communication skills, all of that, right? I get to work on all of that stuff um, working in this community. Um, and then, of course, it's, it is a marketing advantage, right? You can go give talks in places, and you can put out white papers, and you can write blog posts and do case studies, right? Let's do all, all of that. That all matters, um, and it all does add up. Um, sometimes not in a directly measurable kind of way, but it's definitely important and critical um, to a business. Someone right over I, um, here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> My question is kind of about the um, difference between the way it's going where you're seeing what it will look like versus the value of 
for instance, the distraction-free editor or that separating the form, like a, a nice meta box, you know, can really focus you yeah. to just pick exactly what you're talking about and not get distracted by the color or maybe what it might look like in this particular theme when this data might live past this theme or, you know, any of that. So I think about maybe that there is value in not seeing what you're designing yet. And Gutenberg just makes me really curious. Like, is there ever a danger in your mind of merging design and content so intimately when maybe there's value in not, or having the option to not? Right. So this is also a part of the Gutenberg project and, and sort of the, the block-based concept at large and what's in the 2019 theme, which I definitely encourage everybody to take a look at. Um, which is that, you know, we're not trying to recreate page builders in WordPress core, right? This is not this is not a thing that core is trying to do. We're not trying to replace them. This is not like a, a central thing to, to what we're building. Instead, for the core project, what it becomes is that themes should be more prescriptive about those blocks, right? Right now, we kind of have themes that do it all, right? You have like themes that advertise themselves as like, set it up to do any number of you know, things, and some of them include like wizards now to like do like initial setup for you. We have starter content and core. Like, we have all kinds of stuff to support that. Um, but really, I think themes should be more opinionated. They should be more restrictive about like what kinds of blocks can you insert? What kinds of colors can you pick from, right? They should be more restrictive about that stuff. They should be more targeted toward specific audiences, right? Where you have that curated editing experience for that one specific use case, right? It gives us a bunch of benefits. We can have better previews of themes, right? Where people can truly see a theme and understand this is a theme that's gonna work for me and what I'm looking for, right? Your average person is not out there thinking I can, tr I like I was talking about, I'm not gonna take this theme and bend it into a thing that I want. What they're doing is they're going out and they're looking for a theme that matches what they have in their mind's eye, right? And that's what something like blocks can really enable for us, is really actually getting more restrictive about those things, but in a predictable way, I think is what's important about it being in the core software. Uh, hi, uh, oh, sorry. In the center. Right over here. Hi. Uh, sorry. So uh, I, I really like how you ended the talk talking about um, kind of getting past the process and embracing the software and just start using it and building it. Um, so looking forward to phase two, uh, what excites you the most about phase two and what are you looking forward to and what are you excited to build on phase two? I, what I'm really excited about actually is, is the process part of it, funny enough. Um, I'm really excited to see what UX and UI designers do. Um, with this phase two, and, and Mel's looking at me like she's going to be seasick. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I, I think this is a huge challenge, right? Because we have this existing customizer interface that does like some parts of theme customization. Now we have like block editor and the editor. Where do those things merge? And I think that's like a super interesting UX challenge. I'm really excited to see how that goes. And the other thing that I'm really excited about that, that we get to have a lunchtime meeting, it's like in my calendar and everything, um, is about the design systems that could come out of that and so we could have better components for reuse by uh, custom development shops and that's something that I've been on about for a very long time and I'm really excited that this is a place where I really think that we can bring those things together and finally truly provide that for the community. Okay, okay. one more in the middle. All right. Twin. Hi Twin. Um, <laughs> so with the whole idea of making the editorial experience look more like the front end in the way it's designed and stuff, and so it's more in even. Do you think there'll be a time when we don't have the preview button? That's a really good question. I think that's what this previous part about phase two is really gonna dig into, right? Like once we have blocks encompassing the rest of your website, what happens to previewing? What is actually the line between editing mode and viewing mode, right? And I think that that's going to be a really, really cool but hard challenge to, to think about and to build around. Um, and it is possible that we end up in a place where maybe it isn't like a preview button, but you kind of have view mode, edit mode, right? Um, and that is a place that you could conceivably end up with. Um, with. With like different screen sizes and all of that, I think we're still gonna be in a place where sometimes in context, 
there's a preview button, right? But we, I think we may very well be approaching a time where the preview button isn't as much of a thing and just like everything is a, is a preview all the time. So, thank you. Thank you. I'll be at the happiness bar after this for any further questions, like from my CEO who's Great. been raising his hand. So <laughs> thank you very much, everybody.